This morning, Republicans giving in to Democratic demands at the state legislature. We should say that Texas is now closed for business, that we're not welcoming foreign investors anymore, that we're not going to welcome people from other places. State Rep Gene Wu with us from Houston on the bills becoming flashpoints. One of the big debates we're already having with uh, 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 is whether or not to have an elections administrator. State lawmakers looking to fix the Harris County Elections Office and the largest school district in the state. State Senator Paul Betancourt is taking our questions on that. And how much will Texans pay each month to fix the electric grid? We've been paying too little for electricity for too long. People don't like to hear this, but the fact is we have valued cheap electricity over reliable electricity. State Senator Nathan Johnson on the ideas under discussion right now. Inside Texas Politics with Jason Whiteley starts now. Good Sunday morning to you. Lots happening in Austin, so let's get to some of the top headlines right now. Texas Democrats want to give Pete teachers a pay raise, a big pay raise with a state surplus. State Rep. James Tallarico led the announcement last week. He's a Democrat from Austin, and he proposes teachers get a $15,000 pay raise. Other school employees, Democrats say, deserve a 25% raise. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick has changed his mind, saying he will now run for a third term as Lieutenant Governor. Patrick also in the news for reappointing Democrat John Whitmire from Houston to chair the Senate Criminal Justice Committee. Conservative activists are criticizing House Speaker Dade Phelan for letting Democrats have leadership roles in that chamber, but Patrick here defends it, saying Whitmire is the dean of the Senate and the last Democrat that he'll give a chairmanship to. And in Dallas, a city councilman at City Hall did something that caught our attention. When Dallas Sanitation got behind on picking up garbage, Councilman Chad West decided to spend $2,500 of his own campaign funds to make up for a lack of city services. Councilman West there hired a private sanitation company to pick up overflowing trash cans for a dozen families in his North Oak Cliff district until the trash trucks from the city finally resumed their pickups. A Republican bill at the state legislature has drawn sharp criticism and protests. If passed, it would ban citizens and governments from China, Iran, North Korea, and Russia from buying land in Texas. Conservatives say they want to reduce foreign influence here. State Rep. Gene Wu is a Democrat from Houston. He has organized protests against it, and the Republican author has already watered down her legislation. So we called Rep. Wu to get his reaction to that. Uh, Representative Wu, it's good to see you again. Uh, let's talk about these protests that, that happened in recent days. After the protest, uh, the Republican Senator Lois Kolkhorst said she's going to change her bill and let permanent residents or, or green card holders uh, from China, North Korea, Russia, and Iran, uh, and maybe even those in the pipeline, buy land. Is, is this something now that you would support? So I want to be really clear about this, and I think maybe there's people don't understand what it means and people reading the news articles don't quite get it. But what the bill basically did was it would ban people who are green card holders, people who were visa holders, people who were waiting to become United States citizens, got roped into all everything else. And basically, like my, my family, uh, we waited almost a decade for citizenship. We couldn't buy our, our first home uh, that, that we bought. Um, and so this is really discouraging when it comes to uh, like saying like Texas is open for business. Uh, we've spent millions and millions of dollars. Um, the governor's office has their own office in Beijing to recruit companies to come to the state and do business and to and, and to uh, put their headquarters in, to put your manufacturing in. All of that is put into jeopardy by this bill. You were quoted as saying, I believe in the Houston Chronicle the other day, that uh, the Chinese government could retaliate over this, and, and this could complicate the ability for you know Texas businesses working with with uh, Chinese companies to actually continue on with their uh, relationships. But but China, as you know, doesn't permit foreigners to actually own land in China. What kind of retaliation would you expect? So, from what I understand. Um, in relationship with Americans, um, if you actually live in China, if you're a resident of China, you're actually allowed to buy personal property. You're actually allowed to buy a, a residence. Um, uh, can't you, when it comes to I, companies, can't you lease it's a little it? more I mean, complicated. 
You, you don't actually. But that's not the point, and 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 that's not the point. The point is there is no other place in the world called the land of opportunity. There is no other thing in the world called the American dream. If you want to set our bar, if you want to set the bar in this country, in this state, to the lowest bar in the world, then that's your choice, right? But what I'm saying, what I think a lot of us are saying is, look, there's a reason why the United States is the most powerful country and the best country in the world. And that is because we welcome people from the entire world. We take the best and the brightest and from the entire world, and we give them the opportunity that they would never have had in their home countries. I understand, like, you know, there is this continuation of sentiments that come from long, long ago, like old campaigns, like America for the Americans, which really just translates to keep America white. Because we've had programs in the past where we said, like, you know, Everything's okay, but we're not selling to Mexicans. Everything's okay, but we don't we don't sell to black people, but no Jews and definitely no Chinamen. Those are the same attitudes that we have today. If it's a British company coming in, if it's a French company coming in, I'm sure they have no problems. But when it talks about an Asian company or from anywhere else, all of a sudden people get really, really uptight about it. There's a, a version of this in the House, a version in the Senate, which we've discussed both of those. The governor said he's going to, to sign something if it get, if it gets passed. Is there anything the Democrats can do to stop this? Because the protests early on organized by your office have already made the Republican authors change one of the bills. We have to do what we have to do. But this is up to the public. This is not just up to Democrats uh, in the legislature. This is up to the entire public. The scapegoats, the communities that are attacked change over time, but the ideas and the thoughts behind it are all the same. Representative, thank you for the insight. We appreciate it. Thank you. All right, now to an interesting study in the Texas Tribune. Heat-related deaths in our state last year reached a new high for this century. Many of those deaths are migrants coming across the border and climate change also at the center of this. I am Mitra as a senior managing editor of the Texas Tribune, joining us from Austin as always. I am good to see you. Uh, two questions on this analysis by the trip. Number one, uh, can it be reversed? And secondly, have you had any reaction from lawmakers yet? <laughs> Well, to answer the first question, I think, you know, you, you look to what kind of mi migration policy experts and climate change scientists uh, say, and, you know, a lot of what the, the, the 268 deaths that were recorded in 2022 were from, was, you know, as you mentioned, from, uh, from you know, migrant routes, as well as, you know, a lot of people who are experiencing homelessness. And so, you know, the issue is addressing those aspects. And like, you know, it, particularly with, uh, with migrants uh, crossing the border, there's the aspect of them taking, uh, you know, pretty, pretty uh, dangerous routes. And, you know, mm. obviously with the extreme heat, that we saw in 2022, that's the issue to address. And then, of course, with people experiencing homelessness, there's the issue of addressing, you know, you know, fa faulty AC units as well as just kind of shelter aspects. So right. those are the policy issues to address to kind of address that. You know, and I think it's still early in this case for lawmakers at, at this point, but I do think that there's going to be some addressing, certainly about addressing the heat because that was obviously a, a major issue last year. Yeah, part part of the debate there too. Let me ask you quickly about Republican Congressman Chip Roy. He wants to use the battle over the debt ceiling to uh, try to get his uh, border security plan passed. Is that a strategy briefly that could succeed? <laughs> It, it, you know, it's going to be an interesting summer, and that's when the, the debt ceiling uh, debate is really going to hit its pitch. And so, you know, Congressman Roy really wants to make sure, like, this is, you know, A, that the, that the, that, that the, the federal government is spending, you know, responsibly, and he wants to have a say in kind of how that is, but also right. just talking about this issue along the border. And so he thinks, like, that's the right time to kind of to bring this up. Now, will it be successful? He doesn't have, you know— huge support, uh, you know, he's uh, very faces opposition from Democrats and some Ronda Republicans, but certainly it's going to be something, you know, the aspect of immigration policy is certainly going to come up in, in the debt ceiling fight. Yeah, something to keep an eye on this summer. Ian, thanks back to you in a moment here. Coming up next on the program, the Texas legislature debating ways to intervene at the Harris County Elections Office. We'll speak with State Senator Paul Betancourt on some of the ideas. And how much will Texans pay each month to fix the Texas electric grid? State Senator Nathan Johnson makes his argument from the Capitol. You're watching Inside Texas Politics. Welcome back to Inside Texas Politics. Next month marks two years since that deadly ice storm almost knocked out the state's electric grid. Lawmakers have made some changes, but are now looking at wider fixes. 
and many wonder how much regular Texans like you and I are going to get charged to keep the lights on. State Senator Nathan Johnson, a Dallas Democrat, joined us from his office at the Capitol. Senator Johnson, uh, thanks for being back on the program here with us. Let's talk about the, the grid fix. It's been now almost two years exactly since uh, Winter Storm Uri, uh, you know, revealed the problems with the grid. And we're still working on the grid. Lawmakers are still trying to figure out exactly what to do. And there are a number of ideas on that. That's right. It, it is a long process. We did a lot of good work in that session, but there was a lot left to do. And it, it is still going to take some time. Uh, I think everybody expected that we would be further along at this point than we are. But it turns out, uh, turns out it's complicated delivering power to 30 million people. And it, it requires uh, a great deal of work. And it's going to be a while before we uh, have a consensus on the solution. Senator, at the end of the day, how much do you expect Texans are going to have to pay to finally get the grid fixed, to, to, to redesign the market maybe? Really, Jason, not that much. There, there's a lot of talk about the, the burden on consumers from fixing the market. The fact is the price increases that you're seeing are due to uh, other global forces that are affecting prices. It's, it's not the grid fix. We've been paying too little for electricity for too long, and people don't like to hear this. But the fact is we have valued cheap electricity over reliable electricity. And if I ask you to pay three bucks a month to know that you're not going to hit a blackout, you'd probably pay it. Now, I don't want to put pressure on consumers, and I think that we should, as a state, be supportive of local programs to help people who are really struggling to pay their electric bills. But at, at the whole state, we are going to have to recognize if you want a reliable grid, you're going to have to put some money behind it, and it's not going to be that much. Senator, from speaking with you and, and from talking to other lawmakers in, in Austin, um, it, it seems like this is not really a partisan issue, that, that Republicans and Democrats are both looking for real solutions here. That's why it's one of my favorite ones, Jason, because you can't split this into Democratic electrons and Republican protons. It's, it's going to take the efforts of everybody, and there is not consensus within either party about what we ought to do. Uh, so we're going to have to work irrespective of party lines, and that's how most things ought to be, frankly. Senator, thanks so much for the time. We appreciate it, sir. Thanks for talking to me. The state's largest school district might be one step closer right now to being overtaken by the Texas Education Agency. The state Supreme Court this month cleared the way for the state to move in and take over Houston ISD. But what might the ramifications be on this? This is an issue that State Senator Paul Betancourt is watching closely. We reached him about it at his office in Houston. Senator, it's good to see you again. Let's talk about the uh, state Supreme Court this month clearing the way for the TEA to take over Houston's independent school district there. Do you expect now that that legal hurdle has been moved that the TEA will actually move and go forward and take over HISD? Well, it's clearly a huge case because the bill that I authored, Senate Bill 1365, was, was referred to multiple times in the ruling. And basically, as you said, it does plow the road. It allows the TEA to take over the state's largest school district. But it's going to be up to the TEA commissioner, Mike Morath, to make that decision. What strikes me about this case is, you know, this goes back to 2019 when the TEA and the commissioner, Mike Morath, were looking at HISD. And they were, you know, upset about the dysfunction uh, on the, you know, board members at the time. And they were concerned, uh, he was also concerned about Phyllis Wheatley High School, which was, you know, had failing grades. HISD is a, a huge district. You know that that Wheatley has now improved its sure. uh, grades. They're, they're compliant now. Uh, the board has turned over. Hasn't this problem fixed itself? The problem is simply this. You can't let the state's largest school district continue to fail. Now, while we're on, you know, compared to the bottom that we are on, yes, we're up a little by, by measurement. But again, we're going to have dozens of schools that are probably going to be on the improvement required list, uh, you know, in this next round of a, a grading cycle. And really, you got to look for the future because we've had a tremendous enrollment drop at HISD. Uh, and, and it's important that HISD function. No, no matter what, HISD needs to be fixed. Senator, you were reappointed to uh, chair the Senate Committee on uh, Local Government. You're, you're going to have lots of influence, like you did last session, uh, on property taxes. The lieutenant governor told us that he supports raising the homestead exemption up to $70,000 from its $40,000 mark now, uh, which would reduce what we pay. C could something like that get passed in the Texas House and, and, and land on the governor's desk? It is. It already has. In 2000 and. 
21 uh, in the uh, last special session, uh, an increase from 25,000 to 40,000 was passed and the voters approved it last year in a May election. But 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 this is this is reliant on, on the surplus money and, and I'm sure everyone has different ideas on how to spend that. Well, I, I think that property tax relief is way high on everybody's uh, agenda at this point. The, the bill that I carried last time that did that uh, passed unanimously in both houses. It's completely bipartisan. I expect this bill from going from 40,000 to 70,000 to also pass with overwhelming majorities. And these are huge savings for an average Dallas ISD uh, home, wherever it is in Dallas ISD for the rest of your life, you'll save $826 per year. And that's an additional 355 because of this increase already on top of what was there before. So exemptions are very powerful tools to help keep homeowners in their homes. And we're looking at business exemptions as well because you need to have a balanced plan uh, between home and business exemptions uh, going forward. Last time we spoke, Senator, uh, we talked about the Harris County Elections Office and the continued problems there, like we saw in November, not enough ballot paper at some 20 uh, different voting locations. How do you expect the state legislature is going to address the issues at the elections office there in Harris County? One of the big debates we're already having with uh, 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 is whether or not to have an elections administrator and give it back to the elected officials, the uh, county clerk to do the elections and the tax assessor to do the voter registrar registration. Um, would, would that be a carve out for Harris County or statewide? No, that would be, we'll start off, you know, at a, an urban area, uh, you know, with a carve out. But I think that's one bill that's going to be filed. There's going to be bills raising criminal penalties. If you're sitting on a ballot paper in the warehouse and you don't until three o'clock decide that you have to get ballot paper out to presiding judges that are screaming for help, borrowing paper from other bat from other, you know, do a polls. Um, yeah, I think instead of a class C misdemeanor, it may be an A or state jail felony. It's crazy to have this type of response in the 21st century in the nation's third largest county. And Harris County's too big a chunk of the electorate in Texas to ignore it. Senator, we always appreciate the time. Anytime. Thanks, Chief. You know, it's been 30 years since Texas hosted a national political convention. What will it take for one of the parties to return to Texas? The roundtable is going to discuss that when we come back. Time now for Reporters Roundtable to put the headlines in perspective. I am Mitra is back with us from the Texas Tribune in Austin. Bud Kennedy is here, a columnist from the Fort Worth Star-Telegram and Bernadine Steptoe is a political producer at WFAA in Dallas. I right, let's start with you. Houston lost out on the uh, 2024 Democratic National Convention. It, it's been 30 years since uh, Texas even got a political convention. What's it going to take to get one of the national parties to come back here? Yeah, well, it's it's you know, you know, Houston had high hopes. I think uh, you know, something that may have worked against uh, Houston and Texas as a whole when it came for the Democrats was the fact that they lost you know every statewide election by ten plus points. And I think you know when you're when you're hosting a convention, you know, the party's looking for a story to tell, and you know, the story that you know Houston may have been allowed the Democrats to tell didn't quite come through. So you know, maybe when there's something more to tell, you know, with the state and uh, for the Democrats, but I think the Republicans could also come here too, and they've got a strong story to tell. But yeah, it's. You know, Houston's disappointed, I'm sure, but uh, there's there's got to be a story to tell, I think, with these conventions. Yeah, and, and Bud, Houston has tried before, uh, what, last cycle, I believe. Dallas tried before as well, too. The Democrats don't think Texas is probably ready yet, and, and the Republicans are wondering, I guess, why go there? We have the state locked up. Right, well, Houston was the runner-up last time and, and uh, had more of an idea that they might have a, a chance. Back then, people thought that Julian Castro Right. You know, might be a celebrity candidate, but they don't really have a Democratic personality. There's no Democrat who is even known in the state right now. So there's there's nobody to put on show. The Republicans, uh, like you say, they don't need to come back. I mean, they were here 30 years ago. They've been to Houston and Dallas and, you know, they don't need to come back. They're going to Milwaukee where they feel like they're fighting for working class voters. Bernadine, you see this trend changing at all? No. <laughs> all right, moving, as, moving on then, well, I guess. And, and really, <laughs> we can because until Texas becomes competitive, we won't see any. I don't see it changing at all. Yeah, that, that makes sense on that. But let me ask you about what's going on in the uh, Republican Party of Texas. The state GOP running ads against its own House Speaker, Dade Phelan, over this, uh, you know, whether to appoint Democrats as committee chairs. How, how do you expect this is going to play out? Well, you, you see this in a lot of states across the country where you have this 
mega insurgency within the Republican Party that's, you know, kind of running ads and running campaigns against their own Republican leaders. And in this case, in Texas, you have some of the people who are Ron Paul people on the Don Huffine side or Patriot Movement people from Allen West, and they're trying to undermine the, the Cornyns and the Abbots and the Dade Feelings and the people who have been winning everything for the Republicans all these years. Uh, I, I think there's really going to be a tug of war. There's a beginning to be a, a pushback against Matt Rinaldi and about whether to give money to the state Republican Party. And, and of course, Matt Rinaldi, Bernadine, is the uh, state GOP chairman, a former uh, state rep from the Dallas area. Uh, Phelan, though, was overwhelmingly reelected. I mean, the, the, this insurgency Bud's talking about has a, a loud voice, but is this going to do any damage to Phelan? No. Phelan brings calmness to the House, and that's what they need. Obviously, they like his leadership because this is his second run, his second term. And, I, and then keep in mind, too, that his district came out and defended uh, the way that he's running the House. So I don't see any downside. I think that he might have some pushback on some of the bills that he might want to get through that are not as conservative as some of those conservatives want. But Phelan is in a good position at this time, and I think that he's going to stay there because the House with his, in itself wants to get a lot done. Remember, they have a lot of money on the table. Yeah. And of course, he's keeping quiet through all this, kind of letting it, uh, the flame burn out as well, too. Guys, we're out of time. Thanks so much. I and Bud and Bernadine, we appreciate it. Thank you for watching, as always. And we're back again next Sunday to take you inside Texas politics. Take care.